my god. Good evening. Good evening. On behalf of the Anfield High School Youth Vote Committee, I would like to welcome you to Connecticut's seventh, Connecticut 7th District Senate debate. My name is Shelby Brennan, and I am the moderator for tonight's debate. I would like to start off tonight's proceeding with Brianna Correa singing the national anthem. Please stand. Seated. This debate is for the public and is hosted by the Enfield High School Youth Vote Committee students. The goal of Enfield High School Youth Vote Committee is to educate the public to learn about the 7th District Senate candidates. The debate will begin with each candidate giving a one minute opening, uh, opening statement, followed by a round of 10 questions asked by three of the students who helped in, this, in the organization of this debate. The order of questions was determined prior to this debate. Each candidate answering a question will be granted two minutes or 120 seconds to respond. The candidate giving the rebuttal will be provided one minute and a half or 90 seconds to respond. Candidates, your time remaining will be displayed by the two cards, cards by our timekeeper in the pit of the stage. The yellow indicates you have 30 seconds remaining and red indicates that your time has ended. We ask that each candidate honor the time that he will be allotted to answer or rebut a question. We also ask that each candidate to display proper decorum throughout this debate. Following the 10 questions, the audience will be given a chance to have their questions answered as time permits. A round of student questions, as with a round of student questions, each candidate answering a question will be granted two minutes or 120 seconds to respond. The candidate giving the rebuttal will be provided one minute and a half or 90 seconds to respond. Questions that personally attack the candidates that are unclear or that are repetitive will be withdrawn. During this round, additional student questions may also be asked. Audience members may submit their questions in a box located in the rear of the auditorium or give them to the Enfield High School youth vote students who will be circulating around the auditorium throughout this debate. Please write your questions legibly on the paper provided in your programs. Additional question sheets are located by the question box in the back of the auditorium. We ask that proper decorum from the audience will be maintained in this important, civil, in this important activity. Before we begin, there are a few ground rules to be expressed. Please hold all applause until the end, so the candidates have all their allotted time to fully answer the given question. Please also refrain from, com from comments or other disruptive outbursts. 
At this time, we ask that you please silence your phones. If you cannot comply with these rules, you may be asked to leave the auditorium. It is now my honor to introduce the 2014 7th District Senate candidates for tonight's debate. Representing the Republican Party, Senator John Kissel. Representing the Democratic Party, Mr. John Fox. Now each candidate will be given one minute for their opening remarks. Mr. Fox, you are first. Good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, good evening. It's my pleasure to be here, and I appreciate this opportunity. I'd like to thank the, uh, the youth vote for, uh, for putting this together and uh, for uh, Mr. Crane's uh, leadership in, in organizing this. Uh, my name is John Fox. I'm a resident of Enfield. I've lived here all my life. I worked in transportation for 23 years uh, in management and in uh, uh, driving. Um, and then I, uh, I'm currently working in uh, the insurance industry. I'm running for office basically because I'd like to see change. I don't see any sense of, uh, of mandate over the last several election periods. And uh, I'd like to introduce new energy, new ideas to the capital for uh, the residents of this district. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Mr. Kissel, Senator Kissel, I'm sorry. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the students and Mr. Crane and everybody here at Enfield High School for sponsoring this wonderful debate. I'm State Senator John Kissel, and I'm asking for your vote on Tuesday, November 4th. I can tell you right now that after I have served for 22 years, I am no less excited about serving you for another two years than the way I felt 22 years ago. There's still a tremendous amount of things that we can do for the people of the state of Connecticut, and we need to turn this state around. Over the years, I have led the charge in trying to reduce taxes, create a business-friendly climate. I want to continue to help with education issues as well. I currently serve as the Chief Deputy Minority Leader and the Ranking Center on the Judiciary Committee, co-chair of Program Review and Investigations, and also serve on General Law and Legislative Management. I am asking for your vote on Tuesday, November 4th, and I'm hoping this debate makes you feel that you can cast that vote for me and feel good about doing it when the election day rolls around. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Senator Kissel. It is now time for the student research questions to be asked by the students. Senator Kissel won the coin toss and chose to answer first. The first question will be asked by Hanadi Slaman to Senator Kissel with a rebuttal from Mr. Fox. There has been a local movement to create a new high-speed railway stop in Thompsonville. Thus far, the state of Connecticut has spent $550,000 on the project. Should the state play a further role in the development of this project? If yes, why, and how should the state support this project? If not, explain your position. Sure. One of the things that I've been able to do as co-chair of Program Review Investigations Committee is to ask our staff to research, and they're doing it right now. We just had a mid uh, month report in the last couple of weeks as to where do we stand in the New Haven to Springfield high-speed rail. Part of the problem is that the money that they targeted is based upon the federal government not being dysfunctional, which it has been for the last couple of years. So we got a large amount of money for the initial phases of the project. Unfortunately, the problem that I see right now is that there's only enough funding for double tracking the rail line between New Haven and Windsor. That's obviously going to create a huge bottleneck between Windsor and the Massachusetts border. So our staff will report back to the General Assembly in its totality at the end of December as to what steps can be taken to free up some funds, whether it's federal or state, to try to make sure that the tracking between Windsor and Massachusetts is double tracked. And by doing that, how can we also access funding for a rail station here in Enfield? I want to compliment our local leaders, our town council members, and other community activists for really being the spearhead regarding this. One thing that I told the people at DECD and governor's office is that Enfield and the North Central Connecticut towns have been really on top of this. Not only will this spur economic development in North Central Connecticut, but it also will allow us to tap into Bradley International Airport as well. And so we're trying to leverage the airport to try to really make our area of the state an economic hub. But that's not going to be a reality unless we double track and make sure the rail line progresses from Windsor to New Haven. And I look forward to getting the final results of that report to anybody. And actually, you can access it on the web or contact my office, and I'll get you what the status is right now that was presented to our committee just a couple of weeks ago. 
Thank you, Senator Kissel. Mr. Fox, your rebuttal. Yes. Um, my work on the Enfield Revitalization Committee is centered on this, this project, um, working with uh, Darren Lamour and the Enfield uh, uh, Development Corp. And uh, it seems to me that this plan has been around for a very long time. And um, as I said, I'm very supportive of transit-oriented development. But I feel that it's, it's uh, unusual that it took this long uh, for action to come from this senatorial seat. I feel that this is something that the power of that seat could have initiated a lot sooner, especially with Republican leadership uh, holding the governor's seat for so long. Okay, and, and so the point here is uh, we finally have uh, impetus and, and, mo and uh, movement on this. And I think it's uh, largely due to our leadership coming from the state rep seats, uh, you know, David Kiner and David Alexander uh, just recently had the governor up here and uh, several U.S. senators. I think that if I'm in charge, I'm going to be working with David and David and, this, and the government to, uh, to hold their uh, feet to the fire, keep them accountable, and uh, have them see that this development will improve Thompsonville and therefore improve Enfield and the surrounding towns. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. The second question will be asked by May Fearon to Mr. Fox with a rebuttal from Ms. Senator Kissel. On October 15, 2014, the Journal Inquirer reported that Governor Malloy is considering a proposal to introduce tolls on Connecticut state roadways as a means to fund major road projects. Do you think that tolls should be introduced on Connecticut state roadways, including Interstate 91 North of Windsor Locks? Why or why not? I support this initiative only because of my 23 years in transportation. I've never seen tolls. Uh, uh, create an issue for uh, travelers. Now, living so close to the border, there is that, that possibility that people in this district will be impacted negatively in their uh, having to pay these tolls. There are stipulations that could be created, such as Massachusetts has done, where they've eliminated the toll for people living uh, from three exits down to the border of New York, New York State. Uh, that would be one opportunity. I think the revenue has got to be there for infrastructure. I don't see any other opportunities for uh, increasing revenue for uh, fixing up our bridges and rail lines and everything else without some sort of toll. We have one of the most traveled highways in America right at the south end of our state in 95, and it's just congested beyond belief. And it's a lot of wear and tear. It took a long time for them to establish good roads down there, and they're getting ruined just as quickly. Uh, they're resurfacing every year and it's coming out of our pocket. I think we're, we're really being too generous to uh, the rest of the country and, and letting our roads go through uh, tax-free for them while we shoulder the burden for that, uh, that expense. So I support tolls uh, on those major entrances to the state. I know it's not popular, but I think with the technology that's in place, you'll see that there is not a lot of traffic congestion for these uh, tolls. I came back from Boston this afternoon. I had no problem with my easy pass. I think that's gonna be a technology that improves <coughs> And uh, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Mr. Senator Kissel. Thank you very much. And I just want to say that in the previous question, when it came down to the rail station and trying to get the high-speed rail through Enfield, we have worked in bipartisan fashion for the last several years. And I can't tell you the number of meetings where I've been at Voices for Thompsonville and had presentations by folks. And I, I didn't actually see my opponent, but that's OK. Uh, and for what it's worth, Mr. Foley, who's running for governor, will be in Enfield tomorrow, and he'll be checking out the train station location, talking to our local leaders, and touring the site, and l making sure that this is an important criterion in his administration as well. So we can work together to make that happen. Now let me get to tolls. I dramatically and diametrically oppose the position taken by my opponent. First of all, if you've ever been on the Mass Pike when you're coming back on a weekend, there's bottlenecks like crazy. And that bottleneck starts way before the exit for the toll plazas. It starts way, way down on the Mass Pike. It's a disaster. Second of all, trying to figure out where's the easy pass lane, where it's not, that definitely leads to congestion, if not traffic hazards. Third, if you put tolls on pre-existing federal highways, you will lose federal highway funds. And fourth, look at where Renfield is. Do you think people are going to pay tolls on Interstate 91 when they can hop onto Route 5 and try to avoid all the tolls? You will create parking lots on Route 5 and other ancillary roads here in the town of Enfield and throughout North Central Connecticut. It's not a question about raising more revenue. It's about spending revenue more wisely and not doing things like the New Britain to Hartford busway. We can do a better job. We have to be more efficient. Thank you, Senator That's why Kissel. I oppose tolls. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kissel. 
The third question will be asked by Caitlin Passmore to Senator Kissel with a rebuttal from Mr. Fox. Oh, According oh, to the... According to the Connecticut Business and Industry Association, more than one in five respondents to the 2014 survey of Connecticut businesses indicated that their companies are strongly considering moving or shifting significant production to another state within the next five years. Between 2010 and 2013, Connecticut ranked 39th nationally in gross domestic product. What specifically should the state of Connecticut do to keep businesses in and to attract businesses to Connecticut, especially in the 7th Senatorial District? First of all, thank you very much for that question. <clears throat> and I'm proud to tell everybody in the audience that both the Connecticut Business and Industry Association and the National Federation of Independent Businesses, which represents small businesses, both those organizations have endorsed my candidacy for re-election to the 7th Senate. So the folks out there that are worried about business climate in Connecticut want me to stay in the state Senate. Two, I oppose the biggest tax hike in Connecticut history that was proposed by this governor. It basically dampened our economic recovery right when we were beginning to inch out of it. We were told that it was going to solve all our problems, and yet we still lag behind other states. And I'm not saying Connecticut needs to be competitive with North Carolina or Florida, although that would be great. But we are now falling behind being competitive with Massachusetts and New York. We need to do better. We need to be nimble. We need to lower our taxes on things that can drive people into the state of Connecticut. Gasoline tax is a perfect example. Why do people go up to Massachusetts to get gas and groceries and cigarettes and alcohol? Because they're trying to avoid the high taxes in Connecticut. We need to be smarter about that. And we can still maintain revenues by having larger portions of sales. And we also need to not pick and choose things like, you know, companies like Cigna or other companies to the detriment of everyone else. A rising tide lifts all ships. If we create a full and fair business climate for all businesses, then all businesses can thrive. But if we pick and choose, as this current administration does, then we're picking winners and losers. And what is the sense in trying to give tens of millions of dollars to a hedge fund to move from Westport to Stanford? It's a crazy policy. So business groups do support me, and I will continue to fight to create a good business climate here in the state of Connecticut. Thank you, Senator Kissel. Thank you. I'm an independent business person, and uh, I, I don't see uh, a lot of these talking points about uh, Connecticut being so bad and, and all these things as uh, being based on fact uh, for the simple reason that we've got uh, the fourth highest productive workforce in the country. We've got the highest number of technologically skilled workers in this country, and there's no doubt that businesses find this state attractive. Uh, the, the tax increase that uh, Senator Kissel voted against also included the greatest reduction in government workforce in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I think that, you know, to say uh, that, that all of his, all these policies are bad is, is really uh, miscategorizing uh, the, the reality of where we are in terms of the rest of the country. You know, we're very competitive on the global economy. Uh, speaking of the CBIA, I, I spoke to them and uh, you know, in their initiatives to improve Connecticut and its business climate, and they admit that there is no low-hanging fruit and that it comes down to a partnership between government and business to make this state successful. Uh, we, we need innovative ideas, and I don't see that currently. I hear a lot of complaining, and I think all of us are tired of that. I think there are solutions, and they're being uh, used in other states, and I think we can start doing some of those same initiatives in this state. Thank you, Mr. Fox. The fourth question will be asked by Hanadi Slayman to Mr. Fox with a rebuttal from Senator Kissel. Candidates, employment opportunity is an important issue for our age demographic. ConnecticutVoices.org recently revealed that in 2013, the unemployment rate for Connecticut residents between the ages of 18, 16, and 24 was 18.1 percent, a figure higher than the national average. What specifically can be done to create viable employment opportunities for Connecticut's young adults? I, uh, I like this question a lot, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, let me just say, uh, one of the things that's going on in our schools in addition to this program is the, uh, the education of our students on finance and uh, thinking more about entrepreneurship. This is a major point of my uh, candidacy. I believe that young people today are going to have to create their own jobs through, uh, through sources available to them on the internet. I think uh, there are plenty of people out there currently earning uh, living wages by being programmers or uh, uh, 
uh, internet marketers, these types of jobs. And I think this is a skill set that's easily learned through the internet. Uh, the idea that we're going to lure a large company in here for people to uh, work and retire from is a thing of the past. So that's what I would say. In the short term, though, for the 17 and 18 year olds, um, I would suggest that uh, you know, we could increase the, the incentives for businesses to hire the older people currently working for minimum wage, trying to support families on $10 an hour so that they can actually get real jobs and then replace those jobs for uh, the young people they, that would benefit from uh, the part-time jobs that we used to have you know, when I was uh, 16. So um, you know, I'm not sure if there's a second part to that, but um, that, that's pretty much the way I feel about it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Senator Kissel? This is a dangerous situation that we're facing, and as a dad who has a 19-year-old son who's going to a Stunta Community College for at least a couple years to figure out what he wants to do with his life, I look out there and I chat with his friends on occasion and I see that they struggle. There's not a lot of opportunity out there, and to be quite frank, when you look at moms and dads and the families in North Central Connecticut that are struggling to make ends meet, where full-time jobs have been reduced to part-time jobs, and now all of a sudden it takes two or three jobs in a household just to make ends meet, young people look around and they go, is there opportunity here in the state of Connecticut? And unfortunately, what we have seen is a huge exodus of our young people from the state of Connecticut as soon as they get the ability to move away. So we educate them, and we have a wonderful education system here in the state of Connecticut. And I'm very proud to announce that I have been also endorsed by the Connecticut Education Association, representing teachers throughout Connecticut. But once we provide our young people with these wonderful educations, they leave. There's not a lot of opportunity here, and it all ties back. If you keep increasing the minimum wage, there's, those jobs get taken away from the young people. To say that the minimum wage is going to support someone in their 40s and 50s is a fallacy. So we need to make sure that we have a system where young people can get into the workforce, learn job skills, and find their footing so that they can stay here and be with the families that love them. And we need to do that by having an approach that affects all businesses throughout the state of Connecticut. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Kissel. Thank you. The fifth question will be asked by May Fearon to Senator Kissel with Mr. Fox with the rebuttal. In November 2013, the General Assembly's nonpartisan Office of Fiscal Analysis reported that the state of Connecticut's budget deficit for the fiscal year beginning in July 2015 will be around $1.1 billion based on current state government spending levels. The OFA further predicted budget deficits of over $1 billion over each of the following two fiscal years. Does the state of Connecticut need to curb state spending? If yes, where should the cuts specifically occur? If not, why not? I have gone to town hall meetings throughout the seven towns that I've been lucky enough to represent for now 22 years with various reps that I serve with. And you are exactly correct, the, office, the nonpartisan Office of Fiscal Analysis projects that if we just maintain our levels of spending right now for the next two years, the programs, we will face $2.9 billion deficit over the next two years. Now, to hear people running for higher office say they're not gonna raise taxes without pointing to spending cuts, I think you're gonna to have to take a step back and wonder where they're coming from, especially if they promised the same thing four years ago. We have to be more efficient. We have to be more nimble. Wall Street bond rating agencies tell us that we have to. But the stark reality is you can't keep raising taxes to get yourself out of recession. So we have to be nimble, we have to be efficient. I've already said you can make dramatic cost savings by not picking winners and losers when it comes to large corporations and giving them hundreds of millions of dollars. $300 million to Jackson Labs with the promise of 300 jobs in 10 years? That's ludicrous. Tens of millions of dollars to Cigna? so they can create jobs and those jobs are landscaping? That's not a wise use of funds. New Britain to Hartford Busway with several stops in between? Nothing efficient about that. In our agencies, while some are run efficiently, others are not, and the Department of Social Services is a perfect example of an inefficient agency where if we invested in a computer technology, we can make them more efficient, and then perhaps, even with efficiencies, have attrition. I don't want to lay people off. But our government needs to live within its means, just like every family in Connecticut does, because the stark reality is there's only so much money to go around. Thank you, Senator Kissel. 
Audience, I would like to remind you to please hold your applause until the end of the debate. Thank you. Mr. Fox. Um, the Jackson Laboratory investment by the state will yield 16,000 jobs over the next 25 years. Uh, this is an investment for a futuristic thinking uh, administration. I, I applaud the government for its tact on, on keeping funding where it is for education, keeping funding where it is for the towns, uh, while making hard choices. Everybody uh, that's a stakeholder in this current budget uh, took a hit, and that's why the governor is in trouble, because he angered the uh, state employees. There's 5,000 less employees working for the state of Connecticut since his uh, coming into office. You can't complain about that as uh, a reason for uh, the state's position uh, currently. I would say the government alternative, I mean the uh, Republican alternative for the, uh, the fiscal budget this year uh, was a lot of smoke and mirrors. Uh, they, they proposed cutting the uh, earned income cr tax credit, uh, which of course you know, is going to hurt the, uh, the most vulnerable citizens in our, our state. And, and what happens uh, when we hurt these people is that we wind up paying as taxpayers for their, uh, their, their health care uh, for you know, basic needs. We have our lines getting longer at the food shelf. These types of things happen as a result of, of the low income uh, jobs that proliferate through our, our district as well as, uh, you know, the, I'll, I'll cut short. I realize I'm going over a bit. Is it, oh, do I have to wait for the, <laughs> all right, classic. Um, anyway. Thank you, Mr. I've, Fox. Yeah, we'll just stop, that's fine. I'm a rookie at this. Thank you, Mr. Fox. The sixth question will be asked by Caitlin Passmore to Mr. Fox with a rebuttal from Senator Kissel. According to the Connecticut Department of Corrections, the early release program for prisoners allows inmates to reduce their sentences to serving 85% after serving 85% of their time. This applies to minor offenses and does not account for crimes such as arson, larceny, or murder. Are you in support of this program and why or why not? Mr. Fox, I missed the first half of that question. Okay. According, the, I, there's no there's no monitor up here. I just it's echoing off the back wall. So uh, that's my fan moment. If you uh, if you could repeat the question one more time, please. According to the Connecticut Department of Corrections, the early release program for prisoners allows inmates to reduce their sentences after serving 85 percent of their time. This applies to minor offenses and does not account for crimes such as arson, larceny, or murder. Are you in support of this program, and why or why not? Uh, yes, I support this program very much so, because uh, you know currently there's uh, overcrowding issues in the prisons. Uh, there's the, the whole process for these uh, minor offense uh, prisoners to be going through and earning credits uh, for good behavior, or whatever they might call that, and, and earn an earlier release. It's no guarantee that they'll be released just because they have the, the, uh, the credits either. You know, 85%, uh, this is a program that's currently being used in 45 other states. This is nothing new, and uh, it's an effective way to incentivize uh, good behavior in the prisons, protect, uh, in turn protecting our, our prison guards and, and keeping the environment a little stable. Um, so that's the main reason I support that. Um, you know, the risks are there, you know, that uh, someone will slip through the cracks, and I think that a greater attentive uh, attention could be paid to, you know, uh, measuring up who's being paroled and, uh, uh, you know, making sure that they don't violate parole because a violation of parole is actually the, the number one offense that uh, puts these prisoners back in prison. Um, and so that's, that to me is the important thing. You know, to have the system in place that ensures uh, the safety of the, the residents um, in and around the state and to ensure that we are actually improving um, the, the, uh, the prisoner's ability to rehabilitate. Um, and that's all I have on that, so thanks. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Senator Kissel. Thank you very much. Uh, as ranking senator on the Judiciary Committee for now over a decade, I had a chance to get up close and personal with this particular policy. And while I went to seminars and, and gatherings in Denver and Washington regarding this, Commissioner Lance and other commissioners before her said the policy has to be done this way. You do it prospectively, you build bipartisan support, and you do it for nonviolent offenders. That's not what this administration did. They extended it to violent offenders and they made it retroactive. So that folks were getting released, getting 60%, 60 days a month off, or 60 days a year off their time, one, two, three, four, five years back. 
That's why there was no bipartisan support for this. And it does apply to violent offenders, rapists, domestic violence, child molesters. You go through the list, and there's a lot of violent offenders where this early release credit program would apply. And third, what I would say is this. There are folks out there that, but for this program, would not have been out there to commit further crimes. You do the crime, you do the time. I don't have a problem with trying to ease this program in for nonviolent offenders and make it prospective, but have it retroactive and have people sign up for courses they don't even take and still get to the credit. That's a disservice to our victims and to the society that demands public safety. Thank you, Senator Kissel. Our seventh question will be asked by Hanadi Slayman to Senator Kissel with a rebuttal from Mr. Fox. Gun control. In response to the Newtown massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary School, the state of Connecticut passed the Gun Violence Prevention and Child Safety Act, which is one of the toughest pieces of control legislation in the nation. The act has left gun rights and gun control advocates deeply divided. Should the state of Connecticut's Gun Violence Prevention and Child Safety Act be repealed? Why or why not? I did not support the bill, and I thought it was misguided. I will say this. I was appointed to one of the major task force study groups after what took place in Newtown. The leader of my caucus, John McKinney, represents Newtown. As someone who is a part of that task force, I actually went to Newtown, to their high school, and listened for many hours shortly after the incident to parents, citizens, and all sorts of other folks affected in those communities. I drove by the site. In Hartford, we had hearings as well. I don't have a problem with helping fund municipalities to strengthen the safety of their schools, like here at Enfield High School, or all the schools here in Enfield. And in fact, our municipality wanted to have armed retired police officers, and I helped get that bill passed, with the trade-off being that these folks have to maintain current certification in firearm safety through the police officer standards and training. But what took place in Newtown was one crazy guy, a young man, that wasn't found to have been determined to be as dangerous as he was. There was a recent article, I believe, in the J.I. that pointed this out. The town didn't know what they had their hands on. To just point to a certain set of guns and say, ban these and this is the solution, is too simplistic and it goes after law-abiding citizens as opposed to the criminals that commit the crimes. So what you need to do is shore up your school systems as best you can, and each municipality should have local control over that. The state can help with resources, but we need to focus on mental health and not taking law-abiding gun owners and making them felons because they don't register. Thank you, Senator Kissel. Audience members, please hold your applause until the end of the debate. Thank you. Mr. Fox? Yeah, most definitely the, uh, the most difficult uh, situation we've ever faced, uh, you know, lacking the, the first-hand experience that uh, Senator Kissel had in, in all of those. I'm left to listen to uh, a lot of the rhetoric coming from uh, lobbies that represent Senator Kissel and, and probably, I, in my opinion, uh, seem to have swayed his decision because all the, all the records that I've looked at for his position on it seem to indicate that he was in favor for most of this, uh, this legislation. Be and, and it would make sense that he did because there's, there's three components to this. There is mental health. So voting against this bill is a vote against mental health. They've uh, allocated several million dollars to improving mental health. Uh, there's the school security portion, which he just mentioned, uh, which gave every town in the state a certain portion of money uh, to harden the schools and, and create an atmosphere of safety for the students in those schools. And then there's the gun control piece itself, which is, to me, uh, blown out of proportion. Uh, currently, there are uh, all these bills existed, and every change to these bills concerning guns basically just increased the uh, uh, the penalty for violating those those bills that were already on record. A lot of gun uh, rights advocates will say enforce the books, uh, the gun laws that are on the books, and uh, this is a, a, an example here where we've done that, you know, with stiffer penalties, uh, with common sense uh, ideas like having a gun cabinet say, uh, in your house. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Fox. Yeah, sorry. Really not used to this. Thank you, Mr. Fox. The eighth question will be asked by Maeve Farron to Mr. Fox with a rebuttal from Senator Kissel. 
Over the past decade, tuition costs for Connecticut State Universities have risen disproportionately to average household income. Since I began school in 2005, for example, the annual cost of tuition and fees at the University of Connecticut has risen from $7,912 to $25,000, which is an increase of over 300%. During that same time period, median household income in Connecticut has only grown by 15%. Additionally, according to the Department of Economic and Community Development, 32% of Connecticut's high school graduates study out of state. What can be done to make higher education at Connecticut's public universities more accessible and affordable for Connecticut students? You know, uh, I, I, again, I like this question a lot, having uh, graduated from the University of Connecticut at a time when uh, the tuition was on a lower uh, scale. Uh, the thing about this is, uh, there's no way to, uh, to look at it and, and across the board figure out a way for people to afford college without having opportunity in this state. You know, and to me, the relationship there is to uh, create a, a reduced tuition for students who commit to working within the state as long as the state's able to make that business climate there for them to, to take a job afterward. You know, we're successfully creating jobs for veterans and uh, other groups, I think we can focus on students and keeping that talent in our state. So the relationship there, again, is to reduce the, the tuition and then also uh, go to the universities and, and set up uh, programs for them to, to uh, budget their, uh, their costs, you know, to, to reflect the investment that the state is making in them uh, to reduce the uh, tu tuition. Some states have no tuition. And, and that's a radical idea, but that's something I'd, I'd really like to see happen here in Connecticut, at least for uh, the first two years, while students decide which course they want to take in life and, uh, and then have you know, some help from the families at that point. It's an investment that we have to make, and uh, you know, unfortunately these costs are uh, seemingly uh, just going up for, for uh, years and years here, so that's, that's a really tough, tough uh, answer. I think I would work with uh, the committees and, and other people in the legislature uh, to come with with other solutions you know tonight i've given a lot of answers that you know seem uh probably not fully developed but that's because i'm lacking you know what i would see as a team effort from our state legislator also as a, a member of the the majority party i would think that having a voice in there would only benefit the uh the citizens of this district on this issue thank you mr fox senator kissel Thank you very much. This is a critical issue, and I led the charge, again, as chair of program review and investigations to investigate UConn and how it is competitively and is how is the tuition fair with other flagship universities. And what we discovered is a couple of things. First of all, it's higher than what we would like it to be for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's no downward pressure on college car costs nationally because the availability of student loans, unfortunately, who wants to graduate in four years with basically a house mortgage and all you have is your four years of college education? So you don't have those downward pressures that the free marketplace would usually bring to bear. But two, the other thing is this. UConn actually measured competitive with other flagship universities throughout the United States. So what we're seeing in Connecticut is pretty much reflective of a pattern. The other thing, though, that we can do, and we have done, and we've made great strides, is aligning our entire state higher education system, such that you can go to a Snuntuck Community College for two years, then either a state university or UConn, and most, if not all, of those credits will apply. So therefore, you're getting the benefit of those cost efficiencies. And it's taken us a number of years to align this, but we're almost home free when it comes to that. And also, just keeping the pressure on UConn to live within its own means and be sensitive to the fact that middle class families in Connecticut are struggling. But to say that I didn't do anything on this when we produced a report and that was adopted by the legislature with its initiatives, both UConn, UConn did it on its own. We didn't even have to pass any laws. Thank you, Senator Kissel. The ninth question will be asked by Caitlin Passmore to Senator Kissel with Mr. Fox with the rebuttal. Has Connecticut's adaptation of the Connecticut Core Standards, which are based on the National Common Core Standards, succeeded in creating meaningful education reform in our state? What further or alternative steps need to be taken to successfully implement education reform in Connecticut? I don't, I, I don't believe in Common Core. And if we are going to adopt it, it has to be phased in. I just read today, I believe, that Governor Cuomo in New York has said that he's not going to put in Common Core standards uh, and use them for the next five years. 
We can't shove this down teachers' throats. Teachers love to teach, but allow them to teach. Again, I have been endorsed by the Connecticut Education Association, and I'll find out later on, maybe even this evening, because the Enfield Teachers Association was meeting this afternoon. Common Core, if you're going to adopt it, needs to be phased in, and you need to start with the lowest grades first. And it's unfair to penalize teachers if they can't ramp up to it immediately with students that have been following another path for the first five, six, seven years. I think we are at a point now in our education system where we're too wrapped up in A, you know, remember new math, these new fads, these new, new mantras? I don't think that they work. Too wrapped up in standardized tests, where too much is on the line, where teachers feel tremendous amount of pressure to teach to the test rather than teaching to the students. Let teachers teach. And if you ask any teacher, they're not afraid of having policies in place that would weed out the teachers that are burnt out and aren't doing a good job. But don't paint all educators with a broad brush. They're professionals. They love what they do, and that's why they do it. So I don't believe Common Core is the right policy. I think we need to reform it. And I think, unfortunately, this administration made a huge faux pas by not bringing teachers to the table at the outset of initiating reforms. And I think we're seeing the fallout from that. And I want teachers to, to continue to love the, what they do. We need to trust them to do the best job that they've been trained to do. And I don't believe Common Core is the solution. Thank you, Senator Kissel. Mr. Fox? Um, I support Common Core, uh, and, and for the simple reason is, uh, as we were just talking before about uh, creating college-ready students, um, you know, by, by senior year, it, we've got to have a set of standards that, that level the playing field for uh, kids from Enfield, uh, just the same as kids from Westport or Simsbury or, or towns that are actively supporting education. You know, Common Core is difficult for the staffs of these schools uh, to follow it. In, in some instances, but it's all about implementation. You know, if, if the plan isn't implemented, uh, implement, listen to me speak, but anyway, it, it isn't uh, uniformly presented uh, and, and difficult to follow, it is going to be problematic, but I think it's a work in progress. I think that ultimately we're going to see uh, with, with the, uh, the preschool initiative being uh, started right now by the governor with 4,000 students from uh, low income families uh, participating in that program going through with the Common Core standards. I think it's a, an excellent relationship uh, to create a, a sound foundation for, uh, for all students in the state of Connecticut and, and to have uh, you know, standing uh, nationally. I think we'll be recognized as a state with superior uh, education, as we are already. You know, but I, I don't think this is uh, as big a uh, onus on the teachers as, as uh, the senator would have you believe. I, I do think that this is a very good bill, a very good uh, program. Thank you, Mr. Fox. The ninth question will be asked by Caitlin Passmore to Senator Kissel with a rebuttal from Mr. Fo oh, I'm so sorry. The tenth and final question will be asked by Hanadi Slayman to Mr. Fox with a rebuttal from Mr. F Senator Kissel. Charter and magnet schools. Every year, Connecticut public school systems are challenged to provide funding for students to attend magnet and charter schools. In 2013 and 2014, the town of Enfield, for example, spent $1,006,072,450 on tuition for students attending magnet schools. The estimated tuition costs for Enfield students who are attending magnet schools in 2014 and 2015 is $1,902,354. Additionally, overall tuition rates are set to rise between 5% and 7% for each magnet school. Local school systems, however, are not provided with the actual cost until October 1st of each academic year, making it impossible to accurately budget for this expenditure. Should the state of Connecticut assume a greater share of the costs of sending students to magnet and charter schools, and what can be done to address the budgetary issue faced by local school systems? The magnet schools are a, a direct result of uh, Chef versus O'Neill and uh, the need for uh, and improved access for education for um, inner city students and, and, and general choice students from, from any town now that would like to uh, participate in, in these schools. You know, it's, it's not a negative because a lot of these schools do great work and uh, it's, it's, um, it's an opportunity for, for everyone to sort of look at a direction they want to go uh, in terms of education. If a town like Enfield decides not to uh, provide the funds to the schools uh, to keep 
uh, guidance counselors in their in their uh, buildings and uh, or have foreign language or have these these core classes that are uh, uh, crucial or or they're not um, you know going for the idea of having reduced class sizes you know it's it's probably a, a situation that they've created you know that make the students want to go to these these schools these magnet schools and uh, that's unfortunate because so I think like anything an investment in education has a return uh, that that provides benefits for uh, decades to come and I would just say that uh, you know the cost of magnet schools uh, are definitely a reality you know for the towns that don't invest in education but the ECS funding is going up from the state to every town uh, this year is another example in, in the largest tax increase you know did invest in education did provide the towns with some resources to accommodate these students so that they could stay here the problem was we didn't match uh, that that funding the way we should have we didn't uh, see fit to invest even beyond zero percent for a uh, budgeting except for last year uh, and this and I'm just speaking for Enfield but the surrounding towns are also having difficult economic uh, times and I think that you know it's important to realize that with increased ECS funding you know the opportunity is there for thank you Mr. Choose. Fox thank you I think we need to hold off on the creation of any new magnet or charter schools. Certainly the Public Safety Academy we saw develop is, is quite a facility and it's nice that it's located here in North Central Connecticut. But when I've gone out and talked to my municipal leaders, especially the members of boards of education, they have said very frankly, and superintendents as well, especially Dr. Schumann, you know, we can't compete. We can't even go on advertising. I know the town of Enfield has been very uh, innovative in coming up with some of some of their own brochures and advertising materials promoting our local school system. But the money that's poured into these magnet and charter schools is, is dwarfs what the local communities can do. And so that's an unfair advantage. So fundamentally to the question, should the state pay more for these schools? Yes, absolutely, because the state has engendered their creation. And it's unfair to put our local school systems at a competitive disadvantage with these other places. And when you look at these other places and you say, well, why do the students tend to do better in some of them? Not all of them, but some of them. There's the process of self-selection, too. If parents care enough to send their students to one of these charter or magnet schools, they obviously care about their education. And in public school system, you need to take everybody that lives in a community. And not all parents care as much about their children's future as, as others. So I do believe the state should pick up a greater share of the cost for charter and magnet schools and relieve the burden on the municipalities because our boards and councils are doing the best they can. Thank you, Senator Kissel. That concludes the round of student questioning. We will now entertain questions from the audience. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each question. The candidate giving the rebuttal will have one minute and a half or 90 seconds to respond. The first question will be asked by will be asked by Maeve Farron to Mr. Fox with a rebuttal from Senator Kissel. Do you support the recent increase in the minimum wage passed by the General Assembly and signed by the governor? If yes, why? If no, why not? Um, this is a, the question I think I've been waiting for uh, all night. You know, I, I support the increase in the minimum wage uh, for several reasons. Uh, you know, in 1988, I went to a tractor trailer school, paid $3,000, invested in an education for the skill, and I got out and I earned $10 an hour in 1988, and the price of gas was less than a dollar. Um, you know, over the years, all boats didn't rise. Through all those bubbles, we didn't see all boats rise, and there were people that stagnated. And uh, in the transportation industry, there was a large segment that stagnated. Uh, the $10 an hour thing is still relevant to me because in my new line of work, I'm talking to CNAs who've invested in becoming CNAs at nursing homes, and they're making $10 an hour. Now, to live in the state of Connecticut, you know, you really need about $20 an hour. Most people would agree that you, you just can't support a family and live in this state on less than that. Now, to vote against the, uh, the minimum wage, uh, as Senator Kissel has done uh, pretty consistently, uh, to me, speaks of uh, uh, a tone deafness to the people in his district, and this is my greatest concern and why I'm running, because we need people who recognize that the largest percentage of people that are uh, impacted by the minimum wage uh, are living uh, paycheck to paycheck. Okay, and the worst part about this, uh, this latest bill is that the amendment that was put forward 
to freeze uh, wages for waiters and waitresses uh, was put forth by our senator. So that these people earning $5.39 an hour were going to be kept at $5.39 an hour and then have their tips uh, add in toward their, their, their contribution toward the minimum wage of $10.10 an hour. I think this is reprehensible. I, I, I think it's an investment. When you can uh, create a baseline for people to base their, their income levels on, uh, it, it just raises the boats for, for all people. You know, and that, uh, Thank you, Mr. Fox. Senator Kissel? Thank you very much. In the past, there's been occasions where I have supported increase in the minimum wage. Typically, it's during uh, good economic times, but recently I have not been able to support for a variety of reasons. If you talk to small business owners in particular, and restaurateurs in particular, which are very much are struggling, they will state that as the minimum wage increases, they've got to make it up somewhere. And they're not making it up in the cost of their meals or the cost of their products. So they make it up with personnel. And so when we increase the minimum wage, people lose jobs or people are not hired. And typically, those are the young people that we've been debating about here all evening. They're just not getting hired. So there is a detrimental impact if you raise the minimum wage. Two, there's a ripple effect. If you raise that bottom wage, and especially in a down economy, it does have repercussions for everyone else who has a contract. I don't believe the minimum wage was ever designed to sustain a family of four here in Connecticut or anywhere else. It's a base that we say you need to start at. But one of the things that I've always supported, and unfortunately the majority party has never embraced, is let's pick a number, peg it to the rate of inflation, and be done with this issue. But the majority party wants to trot it out every two years to win votes rather than solving the problem. Thank you, Senator Kissel. The second question will be asked by Caitlin Passmore to Senator Kissel with a rebuttal from Mr. Fox. Do you support continuing the Connecticut tax use or Connecticut use tax? With Massachusetts and Connecticut sales tax percents now so close, it seems to be an ineffective means to raise money. Most people seem to ignore it anyway. To the extent there's a cost associated with trying to get revenue and if a revenue source such as the use tax is worn out, it's welcome. Then if you look at the bottom line, I think you're correct that it's probably had its time. And it's probably an inefficient mechanism. To the extent you can figure out what, how much money is actually raised, we need to fill that gap. And so my biggest concern right now is we need to drive down spending rather than looking for other revenue sources. There's no reason why the state of Connecticut can't look at the other 49 states as laboratories for change. And if something is being done in Massachusetts or New York or another state and they're able to make ends meet and it's a tax system that seems to run efficiently, then we can learn from that. But without further research, I wouldn't want to say let's just throw it out right now without figuring out, A, what's the cost of enforcing it, B, how much it does it raise, and C, based upon what we might lose, how can we make up those sums? And so I think you need to look at things in totality rather than piecemeal. The fact that people may not comply with the law is no reason to throw it out. But looking at whether it's actually able to be complied with in a practical matter raises a serious question, and I think it's worthy of more debate and more research. Thank you, Senator Kissel. Mr. Fox? Uh, I, I would agree with the Senator on most of what he said there, uh, to be honest. I, I think any time you have yeah. uh, a debate or, or, or something of that uh, nature, it's going to benefit more people. So, um, you know, the, the, the question of revenue sources is huge, uh, no doubt. As, as most of our uh, revenue comes from property tax and income tax, we have to find alternative ways to raise uh, uh, raise revenue. And, and yes, cutting spending and, and uh, being uh, fiscally responsible uh, is absolutely a huge part of that. And that is why the governor has pared down our governor, uh, our government in this state. Uh, but to the issue before about uh, the minimum wage, uh, it's interesting that, that the senator mentioned the cost of living, um, uh, you know, as a way to, uh, or the cost of inflation as a way to, to mark the, uh, the minimum wage. Currently, it would be $11.10. Uh, an hour, if that were done uh, going back, you know, a couple decades. Uh, so 1010 seems to be right in the ballpark and, and worthy of supporting. Um, I would say that with the increased, you know, actually, you look at Costco, I and mean, there's a, a company that's doing really well, 
and paying their employees. I just don't understand why uh, it isn't obvious to more people that if we don't um, incentivize uh, companies that, that pay a living wage uh, with tax uh, breaks or something, that we end up paying in the long run for the services we provide these people and their families as they try to support their family on a, a minimum wage. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Our third question will be asked by Hanadi Slayman to Mr. Fox with a rebuttal from Senator Kissel. Where do you stand on armed guards in our public schools? Oh, uh, interesting. Uh, this question, you know, is um, interesting to me because I, I was participating in the uh, drive to get a referendum on the armed guards in Enfield. I think the idea is, is, uh, is, is a good one. I mean, it's not a bad idea to have uh, an armed guard, you know, if, you, if the town can afford it and it doesn't impact the rest of the school uh, finances or any of that, uh, or the town budget as a whole. But unfortunately, this, this uh, program cost a million and a half dollars. And I thought, you know, a program started out uh, with the funds found in less than a couple weeks after, uh, you know, put together uh, by, the, by the, uh, the town leadership. I thought it was uh, unfortunate that the people weren't allowed to have a voice in this. And that's why we did the petition. We went out and we sought a referendum. And uh, through uh, the charter issues, uh, there was no movement on our, on our request for a referendum. Uh, if the armed guards could be supported uh, by the town or uh, be funded by the state, that would be fine. But the, pro the, the funny thing is, I think there's uh, our town and maybe three other towns that currently use this, this armed guard initiative uh, for the purpose of protecting the schools. I think hardening the schools is a, is a good idea. I think developing, uh, there was a great program at um, JFK a couple weeks ago where the security expert came in. He said, really, it's two minutes, two or three minutes that we need to, uh, to get down and hunker down while we wait for the police to show up. And that's what uh, Chief Carl Sferraza said. You know, it is about a two minute response time for our police to show up and uh, deal with the situation. I believe an armed guard is, is basically going to communicate to the outside uh, about what's going on in the school. I don't think there's going to be a confrontation uh, in that short period of time. There's just not enough time there for uh, an assessment to be made and uh, a confrontation. So I think we can train somebody within the school to monitor the television, to, uh, to let people in and out of the building. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Audience members, please refrain from comments during the debate. Thank you. Senator Kissel. As I had indicated, I was asked by municipal leaders after they studied this with a working group as to whether the law needed to be changed, and indeed in Connecticut did need to be changed. And so I worked across party lines, uh, Senator Stillman, Democrat from downstate, chairwoman of the Education Committee and I got together, and we established criteria. If we were going to have a, not just armed guards, but retired police officers, so it's not mall security or anything like that, nothing against mall security, but retired police officers, the, the response from Andrea to me was, we need standards. And I said, I agree. So what are the standards? The standards are police officer standards and training, certification, and firearms use maintained currently by retired police officers so that you have the gold standard when it comes to an armed security individual. When it comes to Enfield, I know that some people aren't happy with the money going in that direction. But last I looked, I think upwards of 70% of the people in Enfield support the town council. I believe in local control. This is a local issue. The town has spoken. I love the idea of initiative and referenda. I've been trying to get that for the state of Connecticut for years, so I like that idea from my opponent. But municipalities have to make their own calls. And so I have one town that likes this, seems to be moving forward with it, and parents feel very secure. Six other towns, they decided to go in a different direction, and I respect all those decisions because this is a local control issue as to what the townspeople want to do with their hard-earned tax dollars. Thank you, Senator Kissel. The fourth question will be asked by May Fearon to Senator Kissel with a rebuttal from Mr. Fox. This afternoon, a red alert was sent out due to a mailing sent out by an influential representative who stated he forced Connecticut Water Company to provide safe and clean water to Enfield residents. Are you aware of un unsafe water in Enfield, and how will you help get the confidence back to local residents that our water is safe and clean? Yeah, I got to be honest. I just heard about this today, and uh, I didn't get the mailer. I didn't get the robocall. So this is all new to me. But from what I was able to gather in a few short hours today, apparently one of our state reps sent out a mailer about this water issue. I have to say, personally, as someone who lives right here in Enfield, Fruit Terrace, a couple streets down, 
I've never been made aware that there was a water issue with Connecticut Water Company. Now, in going back, since I've been representing folks for 22 years, I do recall there were a number of years, and not to pick on them, but Hazardville Water had some yellowing issues a few years back where people would, like, their laundry would get yellow and stuff like that, and I, they cleared that up. But I've never heard anything with the Connecticut Water Company as far as quality of water. Our family has never had water quality issues. And I asked my legislative aide, and she's a dynamo, Kate Mac, uh, McAvoy, I said, in all the years you've been working for me, has any constituent called about this water issue? And she goes, none. So I, I don't know what the impetus, I haven't seen the mailer, I don't want to be critical of the representative or candidate that sent it out, but personally, I'm not aware of any water issues other than the one a few years back, or many years back, in Hazardville. And I think that the Department of Public Health, as well as local health officials, would make sure that if there were any water health issues, that the people in town would be made aware of that. So that's all I know. And I, and I think from my perspective, I'd say, don't worry. Everything I know, your water has been safe, will be safe, and there's no threat to the water supply in Enfield or North Central Connecticut. Thank you, Senator Kissel. Mr. Fox? Um, I have to agree. I, I haven't. Uh, received a mailer on this issue, but just uh, going through my, my background in, uh, as a, a student of in the environment, environmental issues that are very important uh, for the sustainability of our community, uh, you know, there may not be uh, an actual uh, cause or issue that uh, is currently ongoing with the water supply from, from either Hazardville or, uh, uh, you know, the, the, and the uh, Connecticut Water Company. You know, the thing, though, is that uh, as companies um, you know, violate provisions for a clean water, and uh, this is a, a clean water zone on the, the Connecticut River. Uh, you know, there is the risk that that we'll be exposed to uh, to higher levels of chemicals that may have side effects for uh, for us in many uh, health-related uh, situations. And I think it's important to be uh, to be on top of that. You know, to to recognize that uh, you know, as our water resources. Um, uh, become more and more valuable, you know, for uh, for us as as you know global warming occurs, uh, we we really should just uh, follow through and, and see uh, what we have in our water. I think you know currently they they have great, uh, they are pretty clean. I mean I, I look at my water bill and I see every once in a while the list of contaminants in it. Uh, I think it's important to uh, to take that seriously. Thank you, Mr. Fox. The fifth question will be asked by Caitlin Passmore to Mr. Fox with a rebuttal from Senator Kissel. Do you support requiring employers to provide paid sick time for their employees? Of course, yeah, and I, I applaud the Senator on his vote uh, on this issue. Uh, he did support it and, uh, and did earn uh, the Working Party's family uh, uh, endorsement that year. Uh, you know, this, this is just another instance of, uh, you know, a piecemeal approach, though, you know, of what we're doing for uh, the most vulnerable citizens in our uh, in our community, in our district. Uh, you know, if we could incentivize uh, employers to provide sick time uh, through tax breaks for these companies that are uh, not providing it, uh, maybe we would have an even more robust uh, sick or paid time off uh, leave for that. And in my line of work, I talk to people every day who, uh, you know, they. They look at things like short-term disability and, and that type of thing because, you know, it's a catastrophe if they uh, lose time from work and don't have a paycheck coming in the next week. So, I, again, I applaud the senator for uh, supporting that. I think uh, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of backlash, a lot of it's going to hurt job creation. And I think that's just the talking point for anything that makes sense for regular people. You know, the idea that anything that's good for uh, the working people of uh, this state or this community or district, you know, it's going to be bad for business. And I, I think that's uh, untrue. You have to look at it as, as a nature of doing business in this state, whether it be minimum wage or providing uh, health care, you know, or any of these things. I think these are all things that, that only make our economy stronger in the long run as people have extra money because they're uh, no longer concerned about their health care uh, costs going up every year or they, ha they know they're going to have a paycheck if their child is sick and they have to stay home. I mean, that's absolutely the way we have to go. And I think uh, there's enough evidence to support uh, that these types of initiatives uh, create just a better standard of living for, uh, for most people, you know, that don't enjoy uh, great benefits Thank of you, their Mr. job. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Senator Kissel? 
Thank you. And, and my opponent's beginning to agree with me, and I'm hoping by the end of the debate I'll have his vote. This is really exciting. Uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> but, but I'm not going to hold my breath. I took a lot of heat for this particular vote, but I, 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 early on I listened to arguments on both sides. And one of the things I said is this cannot apply to small businesses. And they said, well, Senator, what would you consider to be a fair, fair moniker as we debate this, and, and, and perhaps you'll get on board? And I said, 50. 50 is the number. You can't go below 50. And they said, okay, I have a family history where my grandfather and my great aunt were orphaned because of the Spanish influenza. It's a story that's heart-wrenching. They grew up in Philadelphia, and to hear people dancing on coffins as people by the thousands on a weekly basis are dying, granted it was a long time ago, but my grandfather told me that story, it's a reality. Also, if you look at people that are sick, you don't want them working, especially in food service. You don't want anybody in the back room sneezing on your sandwich or coughing. And now we've learned so much with Ebola and some of the symptoms there. So the law was finally tailored to only apply to businesses over 50. It was reasonably crafted. I was willing to take the heat for it. I know a lot of people still aren't happy with it. But I felt the public health outweighed the short-term concerns that were raised. And I think as it's played out, it really hasn't been uh, as bad as people made it out to be. But you know what? Sometimes you have to make tough calls, and that was one of my tough calls, and I made it. Thank you, Senator Kissel. The sixth and final question will be asked by Hanadi Slayman to Senator Kissel with a rebuttal from Mr. Fox. In a May 2014 Quinnipiac poll, 52% of registered voters polled in the state of Connecticut are in favor of the legalization of marijuana. Considering all the positive aspects of this, where do you stand on this issue? Sure. I don't favor the legalization of marijuana for a number of reasons. First of all, we've decriminalized it, and I actually fought that and I actually got a, what I consider to be a good compromise thrown in my direction. I still voted no, but one of the arguments I raised in the Judiciary Committee with Mike, Lauder, Mike Lawler and, and Andrew McDonald was, what do you do with minors? If you're going to decriminalize, what do you do with minors? And they're going to lose their license. Because the thing that a young person really feels most important in their life is their ability to drive. So at least I got the law changed, and I still voted against it, even though they tried to make it a little better. Look at Colorado. Look at other states that have legalized this. First of all, it goes against federal laws. But second of all, that horse is out of the barn now. I almost chuckled, and it, but it's sort of sad when I read that Colorado health officials say, uh-oh, we don't want like chocolates made out of marijuana and things like that. I'm sorry, too late. You, you thought it was going to be just smoking a joint or something like that, and then you can control it? No, you can't control this once it's out of control. Now, I did support medical use of marijuana, because it's heart-wrenching to have people come before you with leukemia and cancer, debilitating diseases. And we set up a construct that I believe is the best in the nation. People say it's too cumbersome, but to me, those are safeguards. So if you're terminally ill or in vast pain, I'm not a hard-hearted person. If this can help you, we'll set up a system in Connecticut to try to help you. But to just make it legal? How are you going to stop marijuana in a chocolate that some kid's bringing to school? How are you going to stop it in a brownie? How are you going to target it? And how are you going to stop people that are driving under the influence if there's no telltale signs or easy way to conduct a test? Right now, the police officers say, I could smell the odor in the car. But what do you do? Technology's racing far in advance of this issue. So I'm looking at other states, and I think that they're regretting their decision. Let's wait a little bit to see how that all plays out before we make it legal for everyone in the state Thank of Connecticut. Thank you, Senator Kissel. Thank you. Mr. Fox? Um, I, I agree that, uh, that, that uh, marijuana use for medical reasons is, uh, is uh, one of the best reasons to uh, legalize it. And I, again, I guess I applaud his vote on that. But uh, you know, the idea that uh, by legalizing it uh, is going to change the usage pattern that's currently in place. Now, it's probably not accurate. It's probably not going to uh, make a huge difference whether it's legal or not legal. Uh, you know, the people that will use marijuana are going to use marijuana. I don't think they need to be uh, thrown through the, the, uh, the penal system uh, over marijuana, however. So there needs to be uh, a constructive way to uh, let people um, maybe explore this uh, on their own or whatever and, and not have the government get involved so much because it's it's a uh, it's a losing battle you know in my opinion too much money has been spent on uh, pursuing people and, and incarcerating them for years and years and years over uh, marijuana you know it's uh, uh, 
just one of those things I think that, you know, it's, it's probably time for us to recognize that we've lost this battle and that we can uh, move forward and, you know, develop ways to, uh, to ensure the safety of everyone else if there is an issue with people driving under the influence of, of marijuana. But, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm, you know, ultimately I'd have to have more information to see how it is working in uh, Colorado. Uh, maybe it is a revenue source for that state at this point, but um, you know, I, I certainly Thank be, you, Mr. wouldn't Fox. be opposed to it. Thank you. That concludes the audience question portions of tonight's debate. Each candidate will be given two minutes for his closing remark. Senator Kissel. Thank you very much. As I indicated at the beginning, I want to thank everybody here at Enfield High, Mr. Crane, all the students, all you folks for coming out on a rainy, sort of dreary night and listening to this debate. I think through our answers, you've discovered that there are strong differences between my opponent and myself. And as much as I disagree with Mr. Fox, I applaud him for throwing his hat in the ring. Running first time for an office, and I believe it's his first run for any kind of office, is not an easy thing. And he's up here taking shots just like I'm taking shots. But I've been honored and blessed to be in office for 22 years, and I am still as excited today to serve you for the next two years as I was on the very first day that I was sworn in. There are so many things in this state we need to move forward on. And one of those things is making sure that this state is a good place to work, have a family, and make sure our children stay here. I believe that I bring common sense to the legislature, common sense to the Senate. We have to keep, and I don't know if the Senate will remain in democratic control or not, but one party rule in every lever of government is not healthy. And we need to have a vocal party holding Democrats accountable in Hartford. And when I read that 50% of people want to leave the state of Connecticut, I say, it's not because of Republican policies that that's the case. We are lagging behind other states, not out west, not down south, but right here in the northeast. We can do better. It's a small state. We need to be nimble. We need to watch our tax dollars. Some of the policies that my opponent advocates are extraordinarily liberal. And I did get a sense of partisanship there. I have proven that I can work across party lines. I believe I am an accurate reflection, not just of Enfield's voters, but the voters of the entire seven senatorial district. And I am committed to continue to work as hard as I can for every man, woman, and child in North Central Connecticut. I'm your state senator, John Kissel, and I'm asking for your vote November 4th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Kissel. Mr. Fox? Um, this has been a, a quite an experience uh, putting my hat in a ring and uh, you know I, I thank uh, the Senator for pointing that out but uh, I feel very very strongly about what I'm doing here and and, and uh, part of it comes from the fact that I I probably voted for a Senator Kissel as everyone else has at one time or another but uh, in the last 10 years or so it just seemed to me that every time uh, we had a, a, a close victory there should have been some mandate there. There should have been an opportunity for the senator to uh, to look at or take stock at what the district was telling him. You know, when these votes came back so close against Karen Jarmock or against uh, Bill Kiner. You know, uh, the thing is, uh, we need people in in the uh, legislature who are going to start looking down the road for the curves, and we don't have that right now. What we have is the proposals from the Republican Party that are largely going to just be uh, cut, 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 cut. You know, no, no, no. You know, and, and that's not doing anything in Washington. It's not doing anything for uh, for Harvard. That's why a lot of their proposals don't get enacted because it is going to affect the towns. It's going to cut the money coming back to the town of Enfield or uh, the surrounding towns in the district, and your local taxes will go up. You know, the earned income tax credit that's going to hurt poor families. Okay, families earning uh, at poverty. Uh, wage levels right now and and what will happen is the town of Enfield and the other surrounding towns will have to pick up the slack there are no ideas coming out of uh, the Republican Party and I think that we need term limits I think that every time he said 22 years tonight I gag you know I had hair when uh, I think he was elected it's possible um, you know the first look I applaud the work he's done there's no question that he's a hard-working guy and that that he's he's done what he thought is best but I do think we need innovative ideas. I think I've, I've heard enough from the surrounding towns to say, where is the senator except for during election season? You know, they don't see him coming out. I hate to Thank say you, that, Mr. but that's Fox. the fact. That's what Thank I'm Thank you, hearing. Mr. Fox. And that's why I'm running. Thank you, Mr. And Fox. And I need your vote, and uh, I will Thank listen you, to you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. This concludes this evening's debate. 
I would like to thank the candidates for their participation in providing Enfield High School students with the opportunity to become more so acquainted with the democratic process. On behalf of the Enfield High School Youth Vote Committee, I would like to thank Enfield High School Youth Vote Advisors, Mr. Sean Patrick Crane, Mr. Sine, Ms. Whitbro, and a further thanks to Mr. Chandler for statistical research. Mr. O'Neill in the Enfield High School custodial staff, Mr. Longy in the Enfield High School administration, Enfield Public Schools Superintendent Dr. Schumann in the Central Office Staff and Administration, the ETV crew for the filming of tonight's debate, and last but not least, you, our audience members, who participated in tonight's important civic event. I would also like to remind the public that Enrico Fermi High School Youth Vote Committee will be hosting a debate between the 58th and 59th Connecticut Legislative District in Fermi Auditorium at 7 p.m. on Monday, October 27, 2014. We now invite you to enjoy the refreshments outside in the hallway and take the opportunity to speak with the candidates. Have a safe and pleasant night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your <laughs>